It's a great pleasure for us to welcome the senior moment, to welcome John here back in his home patch. You've seen as you only grew up, what, down the street? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it's great. Now, I'm not going to say anything, so I'm just going to hand you straight over to John. But I am concerned about the groupies in the front row, so if they get noisy, we might have to stop early. I told you there was no tongues. No tongues. <laughs> Speaking in. Actually, I came in here to Freelance to buy some grocery beads. And it's gone. <laughs> the lending library. <laughs> and it was lovely. It was really pleased to see everybody, including my great uh, uncle Charlie, Johnny Cusick, who deserves an award as, as the, one of the most wonderful footballers in the world, who is still the last man standing, I think, from the Cavan team that won the last All-Ireland. And to, for him to come to my boot launch is a great tri tribute to me. And uh, Johnny, to see you here. I haven't seen you since Judy's funeral, and thanks so much for coming with Anna. Much appreciated. Anyway. I was going to start uh, just to read a bit from the book about my mother, but every every day I remember something about her, and suddenly I suddenly remembered. Do you remember when Charlie Haw he gave everybody um, driving licenses when there was about a hundred thousand people all queuing up to, to get licenses and wait for tests, and Johnny gave every, uh, 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 Charlie Haw he gave everybody a driving license, and my mother got a driving license, and she came back with a driving license, and it was a HGV license. To drive <laughs> And Judy could hardly drive a bloody mini. And I said to her, you could, we could have a lorry and you could drive the, the lorry. But anyway, I'll try and find a bit about her. That, uh, we all miss her. I mean, um, she, she, uh, in fact, I was walking down the street there just now coming from the Farnham. And I used to walk down with her from um, the Farnham in the evening. And uh, uh, who's the, that great character who also died in, in, in the Esco Lodge, the, uh, the wallpaper shop? Man. Oh. Brendan Jenkins. Brendan, Jenkins. Brendan and her were walking along and they came to the corner and Brendan had one of those little tea games at the yes, bottom right. of the Cock Hill. And um, and he sort of because they'd had a few drinks and he went to the tech with, with my mother in the you know God knows how long ago they were eighties. And he was looking at Judy, you're a fine looking woman, Judy. <laughs> and then he turned round and Judy said, Where are you living? And he pointed up to the um, the Tigines, and she said, Oh, that's great. How did you get that? He said, Feel fall, a stroke, a stroke. <laughs> and she said, When did you have the stroke? And he said, I didn't. I didn't have a stroke, Judy. It was a stroke, it was a stroke. And, and, um, and my mother was convinced as we walked down the church street, she said, Poor Brendan. He said, You're looking great after the stroke. <laughs> On a chapter of my mother, I said, I miss her wit and her sense of fun and her total engagement with the life of the small town. When the Euro replaced the Irish pound in 2000, she declared, now why wouldn't they have waited until all the old people were dead? <laughs> it, sneaked up, it sneaked up at her and us. This was uh, her, her illness. Our father died age 86 in 1997. Younger by more than 20 years, she was devoted to him. My sister, Anne, recalls her in old age, ironing Andy's shorts and vests and kissing each one. But there was a sense of relief that his final illness and departure happened just in time for her to assume the captaincy of the local golf club. And when I read my father's last pocket diary, which he kept, there was one dramatic entry after four months of silence. Stroke in headlines. It was in my mother's handwriting. <laughs> in his diary. She had always been eccentric, but perhaps because she was good-looking and charming, her curious manner with people was always excused. This is my son John, of whom I'm extremely proud. She would declare in bars and restaurants from Calvin to Dublin to London. I once in print eulogised late night hot ham sandwiches from Monaghan's pub in Kells, restoring the famished Mackintys en route from the airport to Calvin for the wedding of my brother Desmond. On my next trip home, she somehow engineered a visit to Monaghan's at the top of the hill in Kells. Is Mrs. Monaghan about? She asked politely but insistently. When she appeared, my mother immediately launched 
upon her excruciatingly embarrassing mantra, pointing at me and declared, This is my son John, who wrote about your sandwiches. I instantly bolted for the door, like one of Aidan O'Brien's thoroughbreds, and joined my father, who had been seen it coming in the door where the two of us were standing outside. <laughs> but she was beautiful and daft. Not daft in the sense of mentally unstable, eccentric more like. Brought up on a farm by her mother, she simply thought and acted differently. Take her performance when my father Andy died. I had returned from London, my home, since 1975 for his funeral. He'd been waked and buried, and I, the eldest son, opened the front door of our terraced home in Calvin to a local priest, Father A.B. McGrath. He had come to sympathise. I continued my journey to the hired car, parked at the footpath. I drove to Dublin Airport, 80 miles away, to catch my flight to London. Before boarding, I telephoned home to bid a farewell to my mother. My younger brother Desi answered the telephone. You won't believe what happened after you left. McGrath sat down and drank most of a bottle of brandy and uh -huh. talked and talked. When he finally raised himself on his hind legs to leave, my mother gave him a £20 note to say a mass for the repose of my father's soul. She led him to the door. He dropped dead in the street. <laughs> Judy ran after him and got down beside him on the street. Mrs Garfi, our next door neighbour, came out. I'm a nurse, she said. <laughs> As Daisy said, a frickin' nurse, she must be 80. Anyway, she fell from McGrath's pulse and pronounced him dead. Now she's going around telling everyone how Judy McEntee tried to resuscitate McGrath. <laughs> resuscitate him, she was fucking looking for the 20 pounds. <laughs> she never found it. Her admirable religious belief maintained it, manifested itself after she appeared for the second time on RTE's national lottery show, Wheel of Fortune, she won €80,000. Afterwards, my brother Miles telephoned me in London. Have you heard from the mother? No, I replied. I won't spoil the surprise, he said. Some days later, a letter arrived at my London home, the name and address written in Judy's unmistakable copper plate. I opened the envelope to find a religious card bearing a colour illustration of the exposed, beating heart of Jesus. On the other side was a smudged printed stamp and a signature it looked as if it was a visa for somewhere like Belarus. It was signed by a priest. The accompanying letter from Judy explained that the enclosed gift was a thousand pounds worth of masses. <laughs> which, she had paid, <laughs> which she had paid for and were currently being celebrated by a well-rewarded cleric for the salvation of my soul. I was dumbstruck. There were seven of us in the family. Judy had handed over 7,000 of her lottery winnings to a priest, or gang of priests, who probably thought all the Christmases had come at once. I had visions of masses being said under floodlights around the clock, and sacred holes going up and down like a fiddler's elbow. I telephoned her. Did you get my letter? She asked. I told her I was absolutely delighted with her incredible gift. Heaven beckoned, not lingering in the holding oven of purgatory for me. It was well meant and sincere, and for a woman who was careful with money, she never had much extraordinarily generous. The profusion of masses, however, did not trigger an outbreak of happiness or good fortune among myself, my three brothers and three sisters. My younger brother Andrew has been styled of a brain tumour. My lovely younger sister Joan is in a hospice. Three of our marriages, including mine, have ended, and my middle sister Grania has become mesmerised working for a fraudulent healer in Brazil. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, um, anyway, says here, and shortly after her windfall, my brilliant, vivacious mother left a terrestrial plane for planet dementia. Innocently racist, she had never met a coloured person. She recoiled in horror when bringing breakfast on a tray to my ten-year-old son Paul and his cousin Rory in the sitting room in Church Street. She found them watching MTV with Michael Jackson cavorting. It's a black fella, she declared in horror, suddenly lifting the empty tray to shield the boy's gaze from the TV screen. And when Michael was joined by his brothers dancing and singing on the TV, she exclaimed, Jesus, there's more of them! <laughs> Even in my early childhood, her eccentricity was manifest. On the eve of my ninth Christmas, my father bought her a new electric cooker. It was fitted with a timer, and he explained that she could put the family turkey in the oven before retiring to bed on Christmas Eve, setting the timer to start cooking at 8 a.m. on Christmas was morning. Us children had already been up for hours after tearing open the wrappings on Santa's offerings when my mother appeared in her dressing gown at 7.55 a.m. Silently, she pulled up a chair and sat by the cooker. On the dot of eight, the timer went ping! The oven light came on and the turkey started roasting. She carefully replaced the chair at the kitchen table and returned to bed, satisfied. And more than five years after her mother, my granny, had died in 19... 67, I discovered in a drawer of the dining room sideboard a cluster of half a dozen tiny white quail-like eggs. They were carefully wrapped in linen. I brought them out to the kitchen and asked my mother, 
What are these? She jumped up and quickly snatched the eggs. She was angry. Replacing them lovingly in the hiding place, she explained that, these, that each weekend when we visited Granny and Lavi, she always returned to the town with half a dozen fresh eggs given to her by her mother from her productive hens. These shrunken eggs were the last offerings from her mother before Granny succumbed to a stroke and died. After my father's death in 1997, she became even more eccentric. Reasonably well provided for, she still accepted an offer of free coal from the local charity, the St. Vincent de Paul Society. When I gently suggested that the coal might be better allocated to poor residents of Cavan, she insisted, I'm entitled to it. And even after she abandoned the open coal fire in the city room for a gas appliance with make-believe flames, she continued to allow the charity coal to stockpile in the shed at the back of the house. At the time of her death, she had acquired enough coal to survive an Arthur Scargill inspired minor strike. <laughs> and somehow she had wangled a pension from my father's membership of the National Union of Journalists in London. Again, this regular injection of funds should have been earmarked for the needy dependents of deceased LUJ members. Initially, it was paid in sterling. After two years, it reverted to the less valuable euro. Judy called me in London. John, can you get the NUJ to tell, get on to them and tell them to pay the pension in sterling? Tell them I can't afford to run a big house and a car and pay for golf on the euros they're sending me. There was no point in trying to explain that the NUJ would not take too kindly to discover that Mrs. McEntee had a mortgage-free home, could afford a motor car, and was former president of the golf club, where she played regularly. In 2007, a small house fire was turned into an inferno when Judy poured water over the TV after it started emitting smoke. She was rescued, but was more annoyed about the destruction of an ancient and ugly rubber mat in the hall that my late father had acquired with coupons from the John Player fags he smoked in the 50s. During renovations, we moved her temporarily into the nearby nursing home, Esther Lodge. Little did we know she was soon to spend her last years there. I came home from London to see her. She seemed the same bright, vivacious, uh, people-loving mother of old. I'd booked a table for supper at Sean Quinn's Steve Russell Hotel, 12 miles away. We were running late. She'd forgotten her cardigan. Then she had to help a fellow inmate who'd fallen out of his wheelchair. Finally she emerged. In the car park was a lone, tall woman, standing debonair-like, obviously waiting to be collected. As I held the door open for my eternally affable mother, she walked away from the car and addressed the stranger. Did you hear about the fire? She then regaled this total stranger with a 20-minute account of the drama. Eventually I got her into the car. Her response, I wish people wouldn't ask me about the fire. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so we returned home, but unknowns to us, she was becoming acutely forgetful, turning up 12 hours late for morning mass at the cathedral. She was also wandering about the town, asking just who she was. My sister Anne came home from Boston. On the morning of her return, Judy fell in the kitchen and broke her arm. She was distressed and confused. It wasn't just the arm, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And then over the most heartbreaking 18 months, she was confined to a home. Uh, she did all she could to escape from. Twice she broke through the emergency exit and was caught in the fields heading homewards. My saint, the brother Desi, had to deny her time after time the keys to the front door of her own home. In the meantime, her clothes were stolen frequently, a common practice among the residents. She was still most encompassmentous, and this was awful for a dignified lady to bear. Why am I here? She plaintively asked. Her dignity and high self-esteem were gradually eroded. I came home in the bleak winter of 2009 and took her out. Driving back to the home, she asked me politely for the key of the front door I declined. In the hallway of the home, as I removed her suede coat, her hat and scarf for safekeeping, she pointed to a notice on the closed door. What does that say, John? She asked innocently. I opened the door and walked out to read it. She was instantly at my elbow. John, take me home. Please take me home. Um, um, oh yeah, it was uh, at the conclusion of our next session at the, at the coal hall, I produced an invitation to um, a party next door at the Penguin Book, Penguin Books for Frank McCourt's um, uh, book, Angela's Ashes, which had just sold a million copies in paperback. And um, Frank and um, Harris were from Limerick, and I assumed that they, would have, they were friends. So I said to them, would you like to come, I asked, thinking that Harris would be delighted to join the throng of surrounding his fellow Limerick man's success. I was very much mistaken. Frank McCourt, exclaimed Harris, that wanker, I wouldn't cross the street to piss on him. It transpired that there had been a long-running feud between the actor and the Pulitzer Prizing 
winning writer. To his dying day, Harris was convinced that McCourt had greatly exaggerated his account of his impoverished childhood on the banks of the Shannon. Before fame swept McCourt to riches and celebrity, Harris knew him as a thirsty New York lecturer who occasionally, who occasionally encountered when touring the US with his lucrative earner, the musical Camelot. I didn't know at the time, but prior to writing Angela's Ashes, Frank and his younger brother Malachi regularly performed a stand-up routine about their colourful limerick childhood in bars and saloons in Manhattan. Their aged mother Angela frequently turned up to shout, Lies! Not true! She was distressed by the de destitute ornamentation of the McCourt life in Limerick. Mischievously, Harris said, when you see McCord, ask him what happened to his mother's ashes. I know he fucking lost them. <laughs> Another sip of Boddington's, and Harris told a story. He said, when his mother died, he hadn't two bob to rub together. He wanted to ship her ashes to Limerick to be scattered over the family grave. I was touring in Camelot and helped himself and his brother Malachi out with cash to pay for the shipping. Frank went to a cheap shipper in Queens and he lost his mother's ashes. He fucking lost them. You ask him. We finished our drinks and agreed to reach the <coughs> the following week at the coal hole. I meandered to the Penguin HQ and, glass of wine in hand, gravitated towards Frank McCourt. He was being lionised by the usual circling meteorites of literary female totty who looked at him with unrequited adoration. I introduced myself. He was beaming in delight with the attention. Then, apropos of nothing, I asked, Tell me, Frank, what happened to your mother's ashes? The transformation was instant and extraordinary. He grabbed me by the throat and pushed me up against the boardroom wall. Harris sent you, he screamed. Richard Harris fucking sent you. You tell fucking Harris I found my mother's ashes. You go and fucking tell him. Having upset the famous author, I was asked to leave the party. A badge of honour in my profession. I was unfazed, though my neck was a little sore. A week later, over more points of body to the coal hole, Har I told Harris that McCord had tried to strangle me. He was helpless with mirth. He couldn't stop laughing. He's a fucking chancer. He made up his childhood and he lost his mother's ashes. What a fraud. <laughs> then in 2002, Richard died. And before Frank McCord joined him on the banks of the Celestial Shannon seven years later, I met Frank at an Irish embassy party in Belgravia. It was a reception for his final book, Teacher Man. Uh, his earlier follow-up to Angela's Ashes was entitled Tis, T-I-S, and was described by the one reviewer in the Irish Times as Tisn't. He <laughs> recognised me and had the good grace to apologise for grabbing me by the throat when we last met at Harris's unwelcome emissary at Penguin. He said, I can tell you now, yes, we did lose our mother's ashes. Malik and I had too much to drink in a Manhattan bar and we left them behind. But we did eventually retrieve them. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Out and About with Anya. It's a beautiful midsummer's evening here in Cavan, and this evening I'm in the Chronic Bookshop in Main Street, Cavan. Ah, uh, larger than life, what can I say? And it's on the cover of his first book. Great stories, great humour, and that's what we had here this evening in Buckets. This evening, my guest, I'm going to have a little chat with John McAtee. Hello, how is that? Welcome to the world, John. <laughs> John, thank you so much for sitting down. You had a really busy evening and lots of people wanted to come and shake your hand and maybe they were afraid they would be in the book. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I did make a bit of a mess calling uh, a certain woman the battle axe and her daughter um, took issue. But let, we won't go into that. It's a bit, no, no, we won't. <laughs> Great stuff, John. You've written your book at long last. I'm not one to gossip, but yeah. great stories. You read some really nice, funny stories this evening. Uh, you got a little bit emotional when you were talking about your mum. Yeah, well, the thing is that this, this, we lost her last year, and she was such a character, and uh, she would have loved to have been here, but uh, 
we, uh, you know, she she passed away after six years of Alzheimer's. But she was she uh, she was such an eccentric woman. It's only as I look back, I realise what a character she was. Yeah. You know, saying things like, you know, when the Euro came in in 2000, she said, um, "Why could they wait till all the old people had died before bringing in the Euro?" Which is her yeah. logic about the, the Euro. Yeah. But all all of her all of her life, she was she thought differently. Exactly. Um, your mum was a character around town. Everybody knew Judy. She was nearly as famous as you. Maybe perhaps in Calvin she more was famous. more so. Oh, yeah, but it, yeah. it is a thing and it is sad to say some people do say like there are no characters like that anymore. Well it's not that. I think town always has characters. You know, they, they, the, the, the difficulty is I mean, when I was growing up there were all these characters around the town who used to sort of beg, like Johnny McDonough, who was an ex-army um, giant from the First World War, Mrs. Bandons, all of these. And I, I'm not sure if they're the same colourful characters. There are, there's, a town is always full of characters. There was Packy Clay, another one who used to say... Brendan Jenkins, uh, of course. Brendan Jenkins. Uh, and uh, there's one very funny story about uh, Johnny McDonough, who was um, the local tramp. My father used to buy, um, he used to buy Guinness in uh, Eddie Gorman's. And in those days, Guinness used to go off. You know, you didn't get it in six packs, whatever. You just bought bottles, and it could go sour. And what he used, my mother used to very kindly when Johnny was around, she would give Johnny the sour Guinness. And I was sent into St. Pat's as a boarder, and I came home one weekend and drank six of these Guinnesses that had been left aside for, for Johnny, and went back to the college. And then I came home the following weekend, and my father said. Um, that Guinness that was, we were out for Johnny, it's gone. And I said, oh, I was here last weekend and Johnny called and I gave it to him. And my father left the room and, and my mother turned around, you idiot, Johnny died two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, may I say, that is exactly the essence of your book. It is full of stories and antidotes like that. Not only of your life in Church Street and Calvin, which is great. It seems like everybody in Church Street was a character. But also of your life and times working in the media, where you started off first in Dublin. And yeah. then on the closure of the paper, then you subsequently went to Fl Fleet Street. And you seem to have harboured out the same kind of life and stories. But it's all from you, really, isn't it, really? Well, it's not. I mean, I was, I was very lucky to... The, the journalists have changed so much now. I was very lucky at the time to live in an era where um, you could ac get access to people. You go to parties and, you know, because I worked as a sort of gossip columnist, I remember what, the first job I had was with a guy called Ross Benson on the Express and he used to call me To Do because I used to go to To Do's every night. And the fact is you could go to these do's and there was always celebrities. Now you go to do's or parties or whatever, soirees, and there's a VIP area, there's an access all area, and, and the people who you want to speak to are completely out of your reach, they're not um, accessible. You know, a movie star will arrive with a retinue of 10 or 15 people. Uh, they're not, uh, everything is controlled in a different way. In, in, P, in PR, people just rule the world. I mean, I remember one of the first uh, celebrities I ever interviewed when I was a very young reporter in Dublin, and uh, I was sent along by the evening press to the Gresham Hotel, purely by chance, because John Wayne had flown over. He was making a movie called Br Brannigan, and he came over to see Michael, uh, Lord Killallan, who had produced The Quiet Man. And um, a reporter was sent the night before uh, to talk to him. And John just said, I'm tired, but I'll have breakfast with somebody. And I was sent along. And John Wayne came out of the lift in the Gresham on his own. Uh, and we sat down and had breakfast and a wonderful hour together. Uh, nowadays, um, there'd be 15 people around him. You'd have to mm -hmm. go through a PA who would then go through a yeah. press officer. Yeah. That's interesting, John. Do you think now that, that actually changes, changes the stories and changes the way you get the stories? Because it does, the, yeah. Because people, it's not as good as it used to be. Then. No, it is. No, people say don't answer. The cuff. They don't answer questions. Mm. And you go back to even the chat shows when Michael Parkinson would spend an hour interviewing somebody like Bing Crosby or Robert Mitchum. Now it has to be Graham Norton. And it has to be very short, and there's a whole list of things you can't ask them about. And you also have to uh, promote the movie, the book, uh, the video. 
they keep fit, whatever they're doing. And it's not about, you know, it's not a sitting down conversation where they go into great depth about what they do. The, the answers are, are controlled as the questions are controlled. So you don't have the same, uh, what would you call spontaneity. it, spontaneity. That's a good word for it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, everything you read uh, in newspapers now, particularly about celebrities, is completely and totally controlled. And you have this very odd situation where uh, people don't sue for libel now. What they do is they sue on the basis of privacy. If, if there's a problem with, we we'll said there's one particular famous couple who we can't mention, um, who are one of them is um, been accused of having an extramarital affair, a homosexual uh, extramarital affair, and they, they slap an injunction on the papers. The reason they have an injunction is because they have children. So the judge will give them that injunction, not because it's not in the public interest, but because it upsets the children. And yet, on the other hand, you will have not these particular celebrities, but you will have other celebrities who will take an Instagram of their children on a beach in Ibiza or in the Bahamas and send it out, and it's in all the newspapers. And then they will scream, privacy, privacy, um, if, if somebody invades their privacy. Yeah. They're invading their own privacy, yeah. but in a different way. And it's amazing, the fact that somebody slaps an injunction on the paper makes the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, but often what happens is this particular case, the injunction was breached in America, but amazingly it's held held in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm sure some of your listeners and, and viewers will know who I'm talking about. But the fact is that it's uh, it still it brings the law into disrepute because if the rest of the world knows that mm. the internet is uncontrollable mm. uh, and the American um, readers of newspapers and magazines are aware of who these people are. but it makes the English law look like it's way out of, way out of sync. Okay. To get back to the book, John, um, you know, telling your story of growing up in Cavan, uh, that brings to mind to me um, uh, Dermot Healy. Yeah. And yeah. Dermot growing up, the, the bend, the bend in the road, the bend, I think. Yeah, wonderful yeah. book. Yeah, and he speaks of growing up uh, in Burks, in, in, in uh, Milshawn, Breffney. Yeah, like yeah. A similar kind of a thing going on in there. Well, and people around the town at that time can, can see themselves, can see themselves mm. in the story. Well, with, with, uh, um, I, I, I personally consider uh, his book, uh, The Bend in the Road, as a masterpiece. And it's very like... James Joyce's Ulysses, because what he does is he describes a town and all the people in it. It was a Thursday afternoon, and in his childhood and mine, all the shops closed on a Thursday afternoon. They had a half day. So what you would do was you'd close your shop, the shoe shops, the butchers, the bakers, and, whatever, and they would all go off about their business. And he names all the different people at the time, closing their shops and going to play snooker at the CYMS or going to have a drink in the Ulster Arms, which is no longer there. And it's a riveting account of a town that's gone, because all of these places, a lot of the businesses are gone, but it, it, shops don't close now on a Thursday afternoon. Mm. And Do you Dermot, think your book is doing something like that too? Not really. I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm describing uh, an age and an era that's gone. I mean, when I worked in the, in the anglo Celt in the, in the early... Um, in the early 70s, uh, it was a different world. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, my children are amazed when I tell them that when, uh, when I first, um, uh, you know, when I was first thumbing lifts up to Dublin, coming down to, to and I was bringing my sister Joan uh, up to a pantomime in Dublin, and um, my girlfriend had a sister in Beltorbet, and I had arranged a lift with the anglo Celt um, van to take the two of us up with the, with the two children. And they had no telephone. So I had to send a telegram to Biltorba and the guy would cycle out to the farmhouse with the telegram saying, a lift in South Van, 10 a.m. tomorrow. And I tell that to my children. It was only 1972. Okay, that's, you know, you were in short trousers then and not even born perhaps. But the point okay. is that that's gone, that era. And it's all instant communication, instant access. But in those days, people didn't have telephones. Yeah. And even young people today love to, to look back and read this. You really had to do that? It's yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And that's why I think your book will be a success. And indeed, it, I think it is in a power with Dermot Healy's story. And also uh, Michael Harding, who is here in the scene yeah, as well. Yeah. And his way of just simply sitting down and telling the story as they see it. Now, I don't know what I often wonder if you write a book, 
when you tell a story, do the people the other side of the story, is their account of the story the same? No, I don't think so. That's the problem. <laughs> that's I, often I, I think that's the problem. You know, people have a different view. And, and uh, you, I mean, I, I, I was absolutely horrified to discover my publishers hadn't had it read for libel, and they assumed that I had, Did and I hadn't. Oh uh, my so goodness, I'm worried so we about some watch of the, the space. To people. Now, a lot of the people are dead, um, but it's still, they have children and grandchildren. Uh, you have to worry about that. But yeah. I think um, you have to tell, tell it tell a story from the point of view of you seeing it. And also in the sense of celebrity, which I think is grossly overrated. Uh, I mean, I, I tell a story about, for example, Sean Connery, who uh, has famously mean, 007, he never pays for anything. And one of my first jobs at the Evening Standard was to go to a party he had uh, hosted for a play called Art, which um, his wife, Micheline, had bought the rights to, the West End rights to. And normally, when a, you have a party, um, there's a champagne or there's wine, but he had a pay bar, which is very unusual mm -hmm. for an opening. And Albert Finney and Tom Courtney were two of the actors in the, um, in the play. And I went to this party at the ICA Gallery in the Mall, and um, Albert Finney was furious. His two sisters, elderly sisters, had come down from, from Leeds, and he had to buy them some drinks. And um, I went over to Connery, who was standing at the door, and Sean Connery's taller than I am. He, I'm six foot two, and he's tall, I don't know what he is, but he had a bouncer on each side of him. And I just said, excuse me, Sean, I've just been speaking to Albert Finney, who's complaining that he's had to buy drinks for his um, sisters because of the pay bar. And Connery didn't speak, he just grunted and nodded his head. And I felt under my oxters being lifted, and Sean getting smaller and smaller and smaller as I was thrown out into the mouth. But he never spoke. But that was, you know, that was the power of, you know, Connery. You know, he wasn't going to deal with some jumped-up little Irishman who worked for the Evening Standard asking him questions about why we had to buy our own drinks. OK, John, I'm sure people have told you before that you're a great man for dropping names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you say to that? <laughs> what do I say to that? It's you just know? the people yeah. I hang out with. Well, the last time I saw the Queen, I said that, that I, I, you know, I hate people who drop names, you know. I made that up, by the way. OK, John, your book, um, um, that's a great title. I'm yeah. not one to gossip, but... Now, how long has that been churning around in your head? Not long. I mean, I, I thought about doing it uh, last year, and then I just wrote it quite quickly. And um, I wasn't sure. I, I initially you just wrote let the it. the pen flow on the page. Well, no, I, I initially wrote it away after my, you know, when my mother was ill. I sort of wrote it more as a memoir about her and about Calvin and about um, growing up. And then I sort of put it around to a few people who said, "No, you should really try and incorporate." See, celebrity. Uh, they think celebrity sells, so I had to rejig it in the sense of putting in stories about you know celebrities mm -hmm. and then try and. But I, I was very. Uh, so that's the reason for that. I, I was very keen that it wasn't just about celebrity. And the bizarre thing is that I, I took some advice when uh, you know, to get a publishing deal, and I started the book with a story about Caroline Hearn, who I'd met at the Groucho Club, and then. By the time the book came out, she had died unexpectedly, and people said, "Oh God, wasn't that clever of you to, um, mm -hmm. you know, tell a story it's about Caroline Hearn?" Yeah. But uh, that wasn't the the reason. The, the, it just happened to be a good way of introducing the way that my life was at that time, and I was very sad that she died because she was very helpful to me. But that's the, you, you don't think in terms of. It's very difficult to get a book published, and also, it the, it was seen as too parochial just to have. A, a memoir of, of although I think that was uh, personally, I think that was far more valid and far more important than all the sort of tittle tattle about celebrities. Okay, so there you have it, folks. Um, not going yet, John. I'm not one to gossip, but John, you've got the book out now. Uh, where do you go from here? Um, well, back to London tomorrow. <laughs> Apart from that, physically, are you, was there another book in I there? I don't know. I might, I might actually, because a, a lot of my friends in London uh, who read it uh, thought that the Irish stuff was, was far more interesting than all the... So I might... There's an awful lot of stuff I left out, and as I was saying uh, earlier, I, I, I keep remembering things uh, about... You know my mother, my childhood, about, yeah. and I think that's so far more. So there is another book in there. I'm, there is another. I book, hope so. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, hope so. Okay. 
Well, John, I do know that you've got family all around the world. You've got Anne in New York. And no, Boston. In Boston. Although she's not in New, New York, York at the moment. Okay, no, yeah, She okay. is in New York. And moment. Oh, yeah, and you've got Grania in Mexico. No, she... But, uh, uh, yeah, but... Uh, yeah. I don't know where you know Brazil, her. She is. Brazil. Brazil, sorry. Grania in Brazil. I know, sorry, Grania. <laughs> but before we get to that, you have had a little contact with Calvin TV before, or you, it had came to your notice before. Tell me that story. Well, uh, uh, we were in Boston. Um, and my partner was that I... Uh, two or three years ago and at two in the morning uh, out in Anne's patio uh, in Marlborough outside Boston she's sitting staring at her laptop and I said what are you doing what's... and there she was she was watching a webcam outside the Imperial saying what's he doing there there were all these people um, celebrating and live. Anne was watching you yeah, live New Year's but, night from Calvin yeah. he and was there she was live Boston. watching people coming and going and she knew who they were and she was wondering what's he doing there and whose car is that and <laughs> all it was I was literally do. a very grey street in Calvin uh, with a webcam, I know, somewhere near Dunn Stores or something. Uh, it was more interesting than <laughs> Netflix or Sky, believe yeah, me, folks. Yeah. John, now's your chance to say hi to the folks, Brad. And if you're watching, we're not in the Imperial. Uh, we're Just in yet. Canog or Whelan's, and we miss you very much. And Grania, I hope the entity's still alive, and I hope to see you soon. Well, I see Anne at uh, Jenny Condon's wedding in uh, September in London, in uh, Calvin. And uh, Grania, see you soon. And I'm trying to think, well, that's about all the relatives at the moment. The rest of them are here. <laughs> OK, so that's it, folks. Uh, great fun this evening, a really interesting evening. And I'd like to thank my guest. I've been trying to catch up with him for so long, John McEntee. Thank you so much, John, and the very best with the book. Uh, thanks very much. I'd love you to see you. And that's it from Out and About with Lange from the Chronic Bookshop here in Main Street, Cavan. Good evening.